Well, we're really excited to be here today at the Breaks event. My name is Becky Sims and I'm the founder and CEO of Reflect Digital and I have 12 years experience working within digital. And I'm Sophie Toe, I'm the account director of Reflect Digital and I have more than 12 years experience in marketing in general, but five years of those spent in the food service industry. Brilliant, and we're here today to talk to you about customer first marketing and where to start. So let's frame today a little bit. The world does look different today. Alongside the realities of the last eight months, we've seen transformation. And my word has it been huge transformation. I'm sure many of you watching today have had to pivot your business in some way or find, find new ways to do things. And behaviours that might have taken years to change have changed overnight. But we've all tried to stand together. And I think that's the real result of the last eight months and something that's going to be a big theme in what Sophie and I are talking about today is that as businesses, authenticity is standing out more than it ever has done before. Demonstrating your human side as a business, how to, how to really show the personality that sits behind your brand and that you're not just uh, a brand that they might buy on the shelves or visit your restaurant or whatever it may be. And for us, that is what's going to be key to securing long-term customers. So now we're going to talk you through how to ensure your strategy is customer first. And rule number one is that you are not the customer. We love our babies at work and at home. We spend so much time within our businesses and our jobs that we really do start to believe that we think we know what's best. And in most cases, we probably do. Um, and we, we believe that we know what is right for them as well. But it really does start strangers that spend their money at your business. You know, those people that you might see coming in and out of your door, uh, that you haven't ever met before, but they're willing to part with money that's in their wallet for a service or a product that you're providing. And a really good example of this is there was some research done that showed for marketing people or ad people, you might call them, versus normal people. Um, and the question really was, uh, the question was asked, well, aren't these traditional channels dead already? You know, people aren't watching TV anymore. Um, they're all online. They're all looking at social media. And no one's watching, uh, you know, BBC anymore. They're all on Netflix. And this isn't true. So, you know, the, re the research showed that marketing people, yet 63% of them did watch Netflix. But of the normal people, let's call them, only 30% were. So, you know, people are still sat at home watching EastEnders or, you know, at normal TV. So that's a really good example, number one. Um, and then we think to Steve Jobs, and he said something really valuable in a quote in one of his presentations that was, you've got to start with the customer experience and work back towards technology, not the other way around. So really what he's saying there is, you can't design a product or a service and then try and figure out where or who's going to sell it. Um, you've got to think about the customer's needs and you know what they want um, and then uh, you know go on to produce that product suited to them. So understanding who your customers really are will enable you to adapt your customer experience and your product offering. This one change will separate you from your competitors and build customer loyalty and we all know that uh, getting a repeat customer is far cheaper than getting a brand new one. So it's a, it's a far superior strategy to have in business. So how do we go about doing this? And the first way to do it, and it sounds really simple, but it's to talk to your customers. But in a time poor environment, when you've got so much else going on, it, it can be more difficult than just as it sounds. Um, and you may feel like you already do that. You might have a chat with people that come through your door, or you think you can take one look at them and know who they are or stereotype them. But really until you've sat down, had a discussion and asked them some questions about what do they really like about your business? Um, what is it that disgruntles them? Uh, how, what are the things they want to see change? And until you do that, you don't really fully understand who they are. So once you've talked to them, you can actually then put this into personas. Um, and there's some quite good tools out there, but one that we really like is called Persona App. It's completely free. Um, and on there, it's very simple. And some of the things you might jot down are, you know, the name of the person, the type of behaviours, 
uh, facts and demographics, so what's their age, where do they live, um, and some needs and goals, and that's really the important bit is, uh, so one need might be that they want to live a, a healthy lifestyle, or uh, they want to feel like they're challenged in life. Um, so some of those needs and goals are going to really help to shape and understand um, customers, but also how you put that into your business. So once you've done that and you've got some customer personas, you've spoken to a handful of people, what you can do is identify what customer needs are common. So you, you see the patterns evolving when you've spoken to these people and you see the needs that appear more than once. Um, and really you're looking for things that you don't yet deliver for those needs. Uh, let's say that for someone they wanted a quick grab and go snack on their way to work and yet at the moment you're only inviting customers to eat in. So they're the type of things that you can identify and really change your business uh, to help your customer but also to your business. Uh, there's a really great example of this which from a huge business, McDonald's, um, and it's called the milkshake example because it's quite famous um, across marketing really. So this example is that McDonald's had a problem that they weren't selling enough milkshakes. Uh, and that was really the overarching problem. They, didn't, they couldn't figure out why. So they hired a group of researchers um, and they came into the business and they looked at the, uh, you know, the flavour, the thickness of the shake, is it the temperature, is it, you know, and all of this, they tried to make the perfect milkshake, um, but sales just didn't move. So, you know, it wasn't just the milkshake that was the problem. So one researcher said, do you know what, I'm going to sit in the restaurant and look at customers and understand what's happening. So he sat in the restaurant for 18 hours one day, long time to be in McDonald's. Um, but he started to make a note every time he saw one person buying a milkshake. And after this, he, he went over and he started talking to these people. And it actually turned out that commuters were using a milkshake as a drink to use on their entire commute. So they needed it as something um, to keep things interesting and to last the whole journey. Um, so they, they learned about this and they changed the milkshake so they made it thicker, so that it lasted the whole commute. Um, they added little bits of fruit so that it was like an element of surprise into the milkshake. And then finally they added a, a dispenser in the restaurant so that these commuters could come in from their car, get their own milkshake, leave in like less time. Um, and I guess the point around this is that McDonald's looked at the product and thought, well maybe you know, the milkshake itself is the problem. But actually after speaking to the customers, the problem really was around how can we change the customer experience in order to improve this um, and really in turn you know, change the product, the experience and help our customers. And I guess once you've spoken to your customers, this can really change how you communicate to them. Um, and too many businesses these days are all me, me, me. It's very easy to think that you know, your customers want to hear all about your business and the changes that you're making, um, the new food that you're bringing out. But really, what we should be doing is considering customer motivation. Why are they stepping through the door? What is it that they want to see? And I think that then transitions really nicely onto our next piece of our presentation, customer motivation. That segues perfectly, Sophie, into this part. So the question I've got for everyone here today, and, and you've all saved yourselves by being virtual and not uh, having to interact with me, but the question is, how well do you know your audience? And I've got a little game that's gonna help illustrate what we're getting to here. So this, um, and everyone at home, you can play along and think about this. So I'm gonna describe two people in particular. And you just need to start thinking if you've got any idea who I'm thinking of. So the first point, they both live in London. They're both between 30 and 40 in age. They're both millionaires. That would be really nice, wouldn't they? And then finally, they're both parents. I mean, they're quite wide demographics I've given there. Any ideas? No. Okay. But the point is, these are really wide demographics, but these are often the types of things that we'll use in marketing. We'll kind of, we'll, we'll hone on, hone in on this, this kind of information. So the two people I had in mind were Skepta and Prince William. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't really think of two people that are more different. Um, 
And that is the point. So demographics get us so far, but actually we still don't know who the human is at the end of the communication. And actually, if you had a choice, if you were trying to sell your product or service to Skepta or Prince William, I think you'd probably package it up slightly differently for each of them to, to try and get their interest. And we can't do one-to-one -one marketing, but the more we can start to understand motivations and understand where we're putting this marketing, the closer to that we can get. Because we are all different, every single one of us. What I would react to is different probably to what Sophie would react to when it comes to from a marketing perspective. So today is all about understanding your audience and how to use this understanding. So Sophie set us up perfectly there and we've really started to think about what a persona might be, but maybe more led by demographics. And that's a really good starting point. So you never leave that bit behind, but actually the next part of it is to try and get underneath those people and think about what their motivations are. So again, you've saved yourselves people by being uh, remote. Normally I'd get you to turn and chat to the person next to you, but what I want you to just in your heads, um, as I ask Sophie the same question, I want you to just have a think about what is most important to you about your career. And we're looking for two or three kind of one word answers, and it's gonna become clear in a minute why. So, so Sophie, what's important to you about your career? So I would say number one is the people or mm -hmm. the team. Number two would be being challenged or progression yeah. or learning, moving forward. And then number three would be, I think more so, in a, more so than ever, striking that work-life balance. Yes, definitely, agreed. And other things that some of you might be thinking, and it's not wrong to think, is money. Like that's a huge motivator for some people. Um, status, like getting to slightly different roles within the business and feeling like you've really accomplished something. So. So this is thinking of your career, but keeping those words that we've talked about in mind, I'm going to introduce you to um, the motivational psychology model that we use. So this was created um, by Lab, which is the group that Reflect Digital are part of. And it's a behavioural psychology model using about four or five different proven theories. So bottom, bottom left here, you can see some of those. And if you want to go and read up on them, they're really, really interesting. But what we wanted to do was to create something that was kind of a bit easier, a bit less science led of kind of in the detail of how to think about it and apply it and make it a bit easier for marketers to kind of bring it down to, to the level of right, how am I going to use this in messaging. So it's called Monkey Lion Dog. So it's playful by name and that hopefully makes it also easier to remember. Now you actually can follow the link at the bottom um, to our website forward slash MLD and it will take you onto the Monkey Lion Dog test and you can go and find out a bit about yourself as to whether you're more monkey lion or dog. But the idea is, and I'll dive into the next slides to see these, so the monkey is um, the contextual part of our brain. So this is the part of the brain where, where we want to understand our place in the world and where we sit um, alongside others. And the types of things that, that come into this is that kind of status, so, so where I mentioned that, that's a very monkey driven um, driven part of your personality. We've then got things like fame and purpose and curiosity, all those kind of words. So monkeys really want to know where their place is in the world and what's happening around them and what others think about them. That's really important. So for each of these, I've tried to find an example that we'll all know that to, to show how some advertisers are using this already. So Marks and Spencers are actually doing this with their um, this is not just food, this is M&S food. And we've all, I almost feel like I say it in the pattern of the advert, I've heard the adverts so yeah. many times. They've done a great job there. But what they're trying to do here is play a bit on that status because we all know M&S is one of the places that you'd go to if you were doing a dinner party and you wanted the nicest food to impress your guests, that's gonna be the place that you're gonna to go to buy it. You're less likely to, to pop down to Tesco Express on the corner and, and find the gourmet food. And it's that kind of status. So, so with the words they've chosen there, they're really playing to, if, if that's what you're interested in, then you should be shopping here. We've then got the lion. So the lion represents the kind of rational part of our brains. So this is where we're kind of thinking about weights and measures, and we're trying to decide um, whether something is, is the right value. So we're thinking about money and we're thinking about the impact as well. So things like, and actually Sophie had some uh, lion-led, so thinking about kind of learning and improvement and progression. They're very lion 
um, thinking about kind of really mastering something. Um, money can also come into lion, so it depends whether, um, if you're thinking like, if we go back to the career idea, if you're thinking about money and it's about um, wanting to be able to buy flashy things like you want a Ferrari parked on the driveway, then it's a monkey driver. But actually it can be a lion driver as well if you're thinking of money, well actually I want to be able to, to provide for my family and I need, this is, you're looking at it more from an accountancy level of uh, have I got the right amount of money etc. So it's interesting how some of them cross over and, and sometimes it is that deeper dive to go, well what do you mean by that to really kind of uncover it? So we've got a great example for Lion, um, and it's Lidl, which I'm sure loads of us have seen the adverts with their line, big on quality, little on price. Really nice, clever play on words there. But this is perfect for the Lion because it's that weighing things up. It's talking about the fact that it is still going to be quality, but it's going to be a lower price. So it fits perfectly in that Lion persona. And then finally, we've got our dogs. So the dogs are the emotional part of the brain. Um, and it's where we're really looking for connection and the fact that the people were important and the team around you, um, that's, that's always a, a big dog motivator in the career question. But it's that kind of the openness, the transparency, and it's thinking about those around us. So, and with these, um, the three different parts of the brain, the monkey, lion, dog, you're probably gonna have a bit of all of them and depending on the setting, like at work you might be more lion led, but at home you might be more dog led, for example. But it's trying to understand in your context of what you're selling, what part they're more likely to be feeling at that time. So the, the dog example is a great one here from Lenore. And it was, it was harder probably to find a dog example because people kind of mention it, but they don't always lead with it. But I thought this was great. They've used the, so 99% would recommend the Lenore in wash scent booster. Now, the interesting part is a lot of brands would probably have finished there and just 99% would recommend it. But the important, the dog part of this here is the fact that they would recommend it to their friends and family. They've gone that one step further. And actually that's different, isn't it? If you just would recommend to anybody, oh yeah, yeah, that's all right, you'll like that product. But actually to take the care to say, well, actually I'm gonna recommend it to those closest to me, that's really quite important. So. So that just gives you a quick feel of how kind of monkey lion dog works. Um, I think it's important to note that, that, yeah, as I said, people move between them and, and the key is to think about in what it is that you're selling, what's gonna be important, because what we're trying to uncover here is your audience motivations so that you're then able to use those in the messaging. So if you know you're more of a prestigious restaurant or cafe or bar, then you're going to want to think about those more monkey-led um, ideas like M&S are doing. Whereas if you know you're the value calf on the corner that people grab a bacon sarni on the way to, to work or whatever it may be, then there's, there's more importance to kind of be on that thinking about quick and price driven etc and so it's just trying to understand what's likely to motivate them to want to come and buy from you and how can you use that. So we then Getting close to finishing up for you now. We've created this and this looks really boring on screen, so I do apologize, but you can, um, there's a link, there's been a link on all the other slides, actually this one was too busy, but we'll put the link up again in a moment that you can download all the slides. So this is more for you to take away because Sophie and I were really aware, we've talked a lot about the theory and kind of the, the types of messaging, but then where are you gonna put the messaging? So we've tried to do kind of a high level channel comparison and we've not covered everything, but from a digital perspective. So for example, at the top here, we've got SEO. So search engine optimization. Now, um, search engine optimization is gonna be really important to your business if you have a real digital focus. So for example, doing online delivery or um, the supermarkets are no doubt all fighting with each other to, to be the one that, that gets their slots booked for home delivery now. Um, whereas if you're a local pub, you might be less interested in SEO because it might be more about community and social media, for example. But what I'm going to do, I'll use SEO as an example. I'm going to run you through the top headings just so you understand what we mean by each of these. So active versus passive. So and what we mean here is active. So SEO is active because I have actively gone to Google and I have typed in um, online food delivery. And if your website comes up, great. 
that's what I was looking for. As opposed to passive, so for example, um, we've got YouTube ads as an example here for passive. So YouTube ads would be passive because you've come to YouTube to watch something else, you haven't come to watch my ad, but you're gonna watch my ad because it, it's gonna pop up. And hopefully by my targeting, I, I've got it in front of the right audience, but it is more about um, a passive experience, hoping to attract that person. A bit more like your traditional TV advertising. Um, so brand awareness, what we mean by that is SEO is low because unless they click through, they're not gonna see it. Whereas on something like YouTube, they're getting to see your brand and they might be uh, subconsciously taking that on board. Uh, impact on web traffic. So in this instance, SEO is high because they've searched for it and hopefully they're gonna click on it. Um, social engagement, not relevant to SEO because we're not, we're not on the social channels. Um, potential for conversions is high because I've typed something in that I'm searching for and then I've come to the website, so hopefully I'm gonna buy it or inquire about it. Um, trackable, so we've said this is highly trackable. Now this is getting your Google Analytics in order so that you can track that who's come to the website, where they've come from, and what it is that they've done when they're on the website. So if that's something you don't know much about, you should definitely speak to an expert to get that all set up properly because the beauty with digital is that we should be able to track most things and we should be able to know that investing our money in certain channels is working or isn't working and, and then you can do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Um, demographic targeting, so for SEO we've said no, but for a lot of these examples, well actually all of them other than SEO, because they're paid channels, yes you can because you can kind of create your audience and you can say well I want male versus female or I want this location or, or whatever it may be. Able to use images, so no from an SEO point of view, although there is, there is an exception to that for the, for the bright SEOs out there that uh, know their stuff. So you can um, start to optimise certain things more and you can get like, the knowledge panel at the top of Google and you may have an image there. So, so you kind of can, but on the whole it's a, a no on that. And the same, able to add video, to use videos. So again, you can kind of optimise videos to show up in Google, but on the whole, it's not using video. So we've done that for each of the channels, and, and so what do we mean here? So we've got SEO, we've got paid text ads, are your, your text ads that sit at the, at the top of Google. Um, remarketing, so this is someone who's been to your website, they've looked at something, and you've got a cookie there that's stored their IP address, and then you're gonna show your adverts to them again as they travel around the web. So this is great for those kind of product and service-led pages of your website, where you know that there's been an interest but they haven't converted, so therefore you want to show. So, I don't know about you, Sophie, but I have shoes stalking me around the mm -hmm. internet all the time, and that's because I'm often looking at <laughs> shoes. Um, display, are just when you're across the internet and you're on a news website or whatever, and there's, there's ads, like your kind of tube ads almost, it's, uh, it's like the, the digital format of those. Um, YouTube ads, as we've talked about, so video ads on YouTube. Google Shopping, so when you're searching, this is obviously for product-led um, items, and you get the kind of shopping bar that comes up and you can see the prices and you can almost buy from Google, almost, you end up clicking through. Um, and then we've put four of the social channels, obviously there are more, but we've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Now the way we've rated those is more from an ads perspective here. Obviously, there's loads you can do organically, and especially if you are that kind of pub, cafe, restaurant, Facebook and Instagram are probably your best friends for really starting to create an audience and especially um, this last eight months where pubs have been open and closed again. I've seen so many great things where pubs have shared what they've been doing in lockdown and how they've maybe improved their, uh, their offering or they've created new ways for people to dine and actually the the viral nature then of people going on there and like me going on and going, oh, Sophie will like this, I'll tag Sophie in it, etc. So there's a real, um, there's a real big place for that in your strategy if that's the type of business that you are. But taking into account everything that we've just talked about, about it being more from the, from the customer first perspective and thinking about what they want to see. So hopefully this is useful and you can download the slides and, and take a further look at that. So we're gonna wrap up and we've got five customer first marketing tips for you. So the five things you should really take away from our talk today. So Sophie, number one. Yeah, tip number one is get to know your customers. So if we go through this entire presentation, that's the real premise of all of this is um, 
not to second guess who you think those people are coming in and out of your business and spending money with you and to really understand and give them the best customer experience and product offering you really have to get to know them um, and in turn that's going to help uh, you know separate you from your competitors and drive loyalty brilliant and tip two so think motivation so this is monkey lion dog so think about now you know who your customer is what motivates them and how can you use that to drive action with your business so either interaction via ads or actually getting them on site in location whatever it may be whatever is important to your business but think about what motivates them and how you can use that in your messaging so number three is be authentic i think now more than ever uh, customers are more emotional they want transparency from businesses so how can you be more human and relatable to your audience um, and considering that in all of your communication going forward and then how can you create measures against this so actually if you're starting to think about moving this strategy on and, and maybe you're sitting there today thinking oh, i haven't been that customer first actually sophie and becky might know what they're talking about i'm not <laughs> promising but we might um, but how can we uh, how can we then measure this? So think about um, is it through kind of analytics and the way that they're engaging? Is it going to be through social media? Is it that you're going to create surveys that you can use over time? So like NPS has become really popular for people to get that kind of email where you literally give a score one to ten and you end up getting an NPS score and you run those. Um, periodically maybe once every six months so just think about if you're going to make this change how are you going to be able to measure whether it's actually having an impact and it's working for your business and have you managed to get it right and um, finally refine rinse and repeat and by this we mean that um, a strategy is never finished um, you can continually optimize all of this um, by revisiting it and um, continuing to talk to customers so that you are ever optimizing your plan because I think we've seen how much the world has changed just recently and so we know that that you know we need to keep our finger on the pulse and keep refining. Brilliant thank you so much for joining us I hope you found this useful and um, so you can download the slides at our website so reflectdigital.co.uk forward slash breaks you can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, also Facebook probably as well. Um, and you can find us individually on LinkedIn as well if you've got any questions. Um, we really hope you've enjoyed it and thank you so much. Thank you.